Prince of Wales Hospital apologizes over incident that led to the death of a baby. A woman faces national security law charges over social media contents posted while she was overseas. And Xi Jinping meets Bill Gates in Beijing. Good evening and welcome to TVB News. Earlier this week, a baby died at the Prince of Wales Hospital after she failed to receive medication due to a drug infusion equipment blunder. Representatives of the hospital admitted to being responsible for the tragedy and issued an apology to the infant's family and the public. Timothy Lee has our top story. On Wednesday, Prince of Wales Hospital announced an infant was involved in a fatal medical incident two days after its birth. Today, representatives of the hospital, including hospital chief executive Dr. Chunkin Lai, spoke, saying that human error was involved in the tragedy and offered his apology to the child's parents and the city. I think right now the most important, okay, is to uh, support the family, okay, support the father and mother. So uh, we have uh, sent our uh, clinical psychologists and our patient relationship officers uh, to closely support the father and mother. We have clearly uh, apologized to the family, uh, the father and mother, uh, saying that we, are, we have done wrong. We have done wrong, okay. And then we will uh, show the, all the uh, necessary responsibility. The infant involved in the fatal accident was part of a pair of twins and suffered from having an irregular heartbeat and low blood pressure. Her mother, who was pregnant for 27 weeks, gave birth prematurely, with the infant being immediately transferred to the hospital's pediatric intensive care unit. Due to the child's underdeveloped lungs, it required intubation devices in order to breathe. The infant also showed signs of sepsis and needed a drug infusion to maintain function in its organs. Because of that, two nurses switched to using a three-way valve for the infant's infusion device, which will allow the baby to receive more condensed adrenaline. The hospital said the nurses did not open the valve during the switch, and the mistake was only discovered 50 minutes later after an alarm sounded. Despite reopening the valve, the infant's health deteriorated rapidly, and it died on Tuesday afternoon. The hospital noted that it is currently difficult to determine whether the child's cause of death was the fault of the equipment error, but stressed that they are not trying to shed responsibility. Some patients' rights groups have questioned whether the blunder was related to manpower shortage. The chief executive of the Prince of Wales Hospital said it will take full responsibility for the infant's death. It will also continue to communicate with the affected family on compensation. Regarding the infusion device, the hospital said it will review its current protocol on its usage to avoid repeating errors. Timothy Lee, TVB News. The National Security Unit of the Police Force has charged a woman with committing an act or acts with seditious intention. That's after the 23-year-old posted speeches promoting Hong Kong independence online, possibly from overseas. She was granted bail at the West Kowloon Magistrates Courts today. Defendant Yun Ching Ting left the court this afternoon. Without taking questions from the press. The 23-year-old allegedly published seditious posts and photos on her social media platform multiple times between September 2018 and March this year. With the alleged intent to provoke hatred against the central government of the SER and incite Hong Kong independence. Still, the Defence Council doubted if the court has the right to handle the case when some of the posts were not published in Hong Kong. The magistrate has adjourned the case until July the 7th. Yun is believed to be a student studying in Japan. She was arrested when she came back to Hong Kong in March. Under Articles 37 and 38 of the Hong Kong National Security Law, a person will be considered an offender if he or she breaches the law overseas. The government had earlier released a statement saying the law has an extraterritorial effect, meaning the law still applies even if a person commit a crime outside of Hong Kong. Similar provisions are found in other jurisdictions, such as Germany, Singapore and the United States. As so long as uh, the uh, message is being transmitted to Hong Kong, 
and has affected people in Hong Kong, then uh, the act would have to be regarded as having committed within Hong Kong in the sense that uh, it would give suitable or acceptable jurisdiction to our local courts. So, can authorities arrest a person who has violated the national security law if he or she is only making a transit at the city's airport? Any person who is physically in Hong Kong uh, are subject to all the provisions of the Hong Kong law. And uh, Hong Kong law enforcement agencies can, of course, arrest any person who is physically in Hong Kong. Lai added travellers who have not broken the law have nothing to worry about. The Labour Department has scrapped all provisions relating to COVID-19 vaccinations under the Employment Ordinance. It means foreigners coming to work here no longer require a jab. Under the previous rules, failing to comply with vaccination requirements was a valid reason for contract termination. Domestic helpers from countries including the Philippines and Indonesia were required to be vaccinated prior to their arrival in Hong Kong. Authorities say any vaccination requests made by employers before today will now be seen as invalid. President Xi Jinping met with visiting Microsoft co-founder Bill Gates today. Gates is in China for the first time since the COVID pandemic. Xi called Gates the first U.S. friend he met in Beijing this year. Since arriving in China on Wednesday, Gates has given a speech about the need to use technology to solve global health issues. Tracy Furness has more. The meeting between President Xi Jinping and Bill Gates took place at Beijing's Jiaoyutai State Guest House, where China's leaders usually receive senior foreign guests. Xi told the Microsoft co-founder and philanthropist that he was very happy to see him and described Gates as the first American friend he had met this year. I often say the foundation of U.S.-China relations lies with its people. I place my hopes on the American people, Xi said. With the current global situation, we can carry out various activities beneficial to our two countries and people that benefit humanity as a whole, Xi continued. Very honored uh, to have this chance to meet. Uh, and we've always had great conversations and uh, we'll have a, a lot of important topics uh, to discuss today. I was very disappointed I couldn't come uh, during these last four years. Uh, and so it's very exciting to be back. Gates announced on Twitter Wednesday that he had just landed in Beijing and was excited to visit with partners who have been working on global health and development challenges with the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. The last time Xi and Gates met was in 2015 on the sidelines of Bo Ao Forum in Hainan. In 2020, Xi wrote a letter to Gates thanking him and his foundation for pledging assistance to China in its fight against COVID. Tracy Furness, TVB News. In a media interview, former U.S. Secretary of State Henry Kissinger said he believes military conflict over Taiwan is likely if tensions between Beijing and Taipei remain high. This comes with U.S. Secretary of State Antony Blinken set to visit China between the 18th and 19th of June. Daniel Rao tells us more. Former U.S. Secretary of State Henry Kissinger, who recently celebrated his 100th birthday, outlined his views on the Taiwan situation and U.S.-China relations in an interview with Bloomberg. He believed tensions between Beijing and Taipei could still further escalate. On the current trajectory of relations, I think some military conflict is probable. However, he said this trajectory must be altered. On U.S.-China relations, which are being increasingly strained by factors including the Taiwan situation, Kissinger said the two sides hadn't yet engaged in the kind of dialogue he had suggested. Kissinger's comments come with U.S. Secretary of State Antony Blinken set to visit China between the 18th and 19th of June. Blinken will be the highest-ranking U.S. government official to visit China since U.S. President Joe Biden took office in January 2021. In a pre-trip briefing, U.S. officials said they have no expectation the trip will yield a breakthrough. That followed a tense evening phone call on Tuesday, during which Chinese Foreign Minister Qin Gang told Blinken the U.S. should stop meddling in Beijing's affairs. China's foreign ministry said on Friday that vicious competition cannot be engaged in and that the United States should not fantasize that it is dealing with China from a position of strength. 
Regarding Washington's stance on Beijing, Foreign Ministry spokesperson Wang Wenbin said this is not so-called responsible competition, but extremely irresponsible hegemonic behavior, which will only push China and the U.S. towards confrontation. Wang said China will expound its positions and concerns on relations with the U.S. during Blinken's visit. Before the visit, U.S. Secretary of State Blinken met with his Moldavian counterpart Abdullah Shahid in Washington, D.C., ahead of the reopening of the country's embassy in the U.S. capital. The U.S. has made moves to open embassies in Indo-Pacific nations as China made significant diplomatic inroads in the Indian Ocean Islands. Danurel, TVB News. An American nuclear submarine has docked in South Korea a day after North Korea fired two ballistic missiles off its east coast. This as South Korea said it had recovered part of a rocket that Pyongyang launched last month, claiming it was a military satellite. Matthew Bay reports. This is part of a rocket salvaged from the seabed off the west coast of the Korean peninsula, according to South Korea's Joint Chiefs of Staff. It is from a North Korean spy satellite launch last month that Pyongyang says was a space launch vehicle. The search continues for more debris, which will offer clues as to how much progress has been made on its missile capabilities. On Thursday, the North fired two short-range ballistic missiles off its east coast that landed in Japan's exclusive economic zone. It's estimated they flew around 850 kilometres and reached an altitude of 50 kilometres. The launch drew condemnation from Tokyo and Washington. These launches are a clear violation of multiple UN Security Council resolutions. <clears throat> they demonstrate the threat of DPRK's unlawful weapons of mass destruction and ballistic missile uh, <clears throat> programs posed to the region, to international peace and security, and to the global nonproliferation regime. The launches came after South Korean and American forces ended a fifth round of live fire drills near the border with North Korea. On Friday, the USS Michigan, a nuclear powered submarine, arrived in Busan. This is the first visit of its kind in six years and is part of a recent bilateral agreement enhancing the visibility of U.S. strategic assets in the Korean Peninsula. The two navies will be conducting exercises on boosting their special operation capabilities, the South Korean Defense Ministry said in a statement. Matthew Bray, TVB News. Still ahead on tonight's news. First meeting of the Chief Executive's Policy Unit Expert Group is held today. Two floating ducks will leave Hong Kong early. The Pope returns to work after recovering from operation. Welcome back to TVB News. The Chief Executive's Policy Unit Expert Group held its first meeting today. Chairing the group, Stephen Wong hopes the top think tank could help the government grasp Hong Kong's situation more holistically. Jacqueline spoke with some members of the group. The 56-strong Chief Executive's Policy Unit Expert Group held their first meeting at the central government offices in three sessions, namely the Economic Advancement, Social Development and Research Strategy Expert Groups. The theme of the day, Achieving High-Quality Development for Hong Kong. Adam Kwok of San Hong Kai Properties, member of the Economic Group, said the panel discussed how Hong Kong could cement its position as a global financial hub and draw world talent. Also mentioned was the Northern Metropolis Development Strategy. The Social Development Expert Group discussed topics surrounding medical issues and green finance. Group member Lo Po Man told us they also spotlighted the importance of public support to people with mental health, especially after the mall attack earlier this month. Those challenged by uh, health, mental health issues will have to wait for a pretty long time, and that can lead to severe consequences. So what we really need is to train um, the next generation of mental health professionals and really devote more resources. Though Chief Executive John Lee was not present at the meeting this time, group member Eugene Chan believes the think tank could still relay insights to the city's leader. So, Dr. Chan, do you think the Chief Executive's Policy Unit is going to perform more effectively than its previous incarnations? I had the privilege of serving on the Central Policy Unit in, in the past few governments, and I felt this time it's very different because it has said specifically they're looking for output to the Chief Executive. In the past, the CEPU is serving the Chief Executive, Chief Secretary and the, and the Financial Secretary. This is directly to the Chief Executive. If everything is said so clearly and being transparently, I felt that we are now 
in the, in the best possible time, especially in such a strong and executive-led government. Eugene Chen is also a program host at TVB Pearl. Head of the group Stephen Wong said the policy unit will carefully collate and analyze the views and suggestions put forward by members. While the chief executive's policy unit only holds such panel-wide meetings twice a year, policy unit members told us there will be more frequent focus groups with experts invited to discuss specific topics. Jacqueline, TVB News. Police arrested six people in connection with alleged criminal damage on showrooms of mainland carmaker BYD. The four showrooms in Wan Chai, Tsim Sha Chou and Tin Shou Wai were daubed with red paint in the early morning on Monday. Its showroom in Yunlong, meanwhile, saw its gates damaged, allegedly being crashed into by a car. The five men and one woman arrested are between 34 and 48. The five men have triad backgrounds. A police investigation suggests the vandalism likely stemmed from disputes, but it's not clear whether it involves individuals or is between companies. The two inflatable ducks on display in Victoria Harbour will wrap up one week earlier than scheduled as organisers worry about rising costs and weather conditions. The much-loved giant rubber ducks have been in the harbour since last Saturday. Even when one of the ducks was deflated because of the hot weather, interest didn't wane. Still, the organiser today decided to shorten the two-week exhibition and end it on Sunday, which is also Father's Day. As scheduled, one of the ducks will tour around the harbour that day, starting at 1pm, swimming past Causeway Bay and Tim Sha Chou. The public are reminded to avoid sailing boats too close to the ducks. 86-year-old Pope Francis has returned to work after nine days in medical care following an operation on an abdominal hernia. Francis left hospital in a wheelchair but seemed in good spirits. The Pope stopped to pray at the Basilica of St. Mary Major. He did the same when he recovered from colon surgery two years ago. The surgeon who operated on him this time says the pontiff is well enough to travel. He's scheduled to visit Portugal and Mongolia in August. South African President Cyril Ramaphosa arrived in Ukraine on Friday as part of an African peace mission. Ramaphosa is expected to meet Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky and then travel to Russia for talks with President Vladimir Putin in St. Petersburg. He is heading a delegation including leaders from Senegal, Zambia and Comoros and Egypt. Meanwhile, Russia's defense ministry said that Ukrainian forces had continued to suffer heavy losses in Donetsk, where Ukraine's counteroffensive has been focused. In the UK, the ruling Conservative Party is at loggerheads as they try to move on from a damning report into former Prime Minister Boris Johnson, who was found to have deliberately misled Parliament. Johnson's already resigned as a lawmaker, but called the inquiry deranged. David Garrett reports. Did you jump so you couldn't be pushed, Mr Johnson? Thank you Boris Johnson resigned as a member of parliament last week, knowing the report was coming, he walked away before suspension. The former prime minister had sat with a committee of MPs last year to explain why he hosted parties at Downing Street while the country was in a Covid lockdown. He said it was necessary to meet for work. The parliamentary inquiry found he'd held parties and misled the House. Well, I think the Privileges Committee is pretty damning. You know, it's serious. Boris Johnson is not only a lawbreaker, but a liar. He's not fit for public office and he's disgraced himself. Johnson got Brexit done and served up a massive general election victory. But less than four years on, many voters have lost faith. I just feel like he just shows time and time again how much of a buffoon he is. He's likeable and funny, but just should never have been in that role in the first place. Maybe he kind of clung on to power a bit, kind of reminded me of a good, good old Trump. MPs will vote on the inquiry's findings on Monday. If Johnson had not already resigned, they'd likely be handing him a 90-day ban. But many Conservatives still think he's the man to lead the party. Johnson called the report into his behaviour a charade. I think in the last few days, with uh, the Privileges Committee report on Boris Johnson and his reaction to it, he really has gone full-on Donald Trump. 
um, accusing the committee of being some sort of conspiracy against him, um, talking about it as a kangaroo court. Despite all his problems, could Johnson make a comeback? Uh, so I think uh, the options for Boris Johnson are much more limited, perhaps, than they are for, for uh, Donald Trump. You know, while you can point to a third of Conservative voters still having faith in some ways in Boris Johnson, it's nothing like the number of Republican voters who still have faith in Donald Trump. David Garrett, TVB News. A bus carrying elderly people to a casino collided with a truck in a rural part of Manitoba in Canada, killing 15 and injuring 10 others. Images broadcast from the crash scene showed a truck off the road and tarpaulins being used to cover bodies. The dead are believed to be mainly senior citizens. The drivers of both vehicles survived, according to Royal Canadian Mounted Police. The investigation is centred around which vehicle had the right of way. Most of those on the bus are thought to be from the community of Dauphin, Manitoba. That's the news. Thanks for watching.